to see another account where he returns to the original side of the sea and we're going to see a picture of faith. The word faith in the Christian walk is not a new word. It's probably something that you use more frequently than any other. We hear the word faith even in secular communications when we watch television. There isn't a real, heretical, fake, cult version of Christianity that doesn't use the word faith. Even atheists will use the word faith. And many people, even us Christians, we misuse that word. We use it as if it's a lottery ticket or as if it's an unknown. We, we say faith and what we really mean is I hope, right? Um, the, the classic illustration, which is not complicated, is you can stand on the roof of this building facing the back parking lot. It's the highest drop. And you can have all the faith in the world that you're not going to fall to your Hopefully not death, maybe some broken legs, but you can have all the faith in the world that you're going to fly. But I promise you, if you jump off that roof, you're going to fall to the ground. That faith doesn't, it's not faith. That's hope. That's wishful thinking. The faith of the Bible, the faith that we hear about in Scripture, God's word, his truth and his revelation for to us is more than that. The faith of the Bible means to be fully convinced. It means to trust in something that is trustworthy. It means to know that when you put your feet on the floor, you're not going to fall through to the center of the earth. It's a, a faith of the Bible is a trust in something that you can know is true. It's a much stronger word than the world would have you believe. Today, we are going to learn that faith in Jesus is an active and observable way of living that is powered by his grace. Today, we're going to talk about faith and we're going to see three examples of it. We're going to see an active faith. We're going to see an observable faith. And then we're going to see that faith is not something that we can just have. It is actually a gift from God. So let's turn to the word and let's begin in verse 40. If you have your copy of the scriptures, you can read along there. If not, we'll have it on the screen. This is verse 40 in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 8. When Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him. For they were all expecting him. Just then a man named Jairus came. He was a leader of the synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet and pleaded with him to come to his house because he had an only daughter about 12 years old and she was dying. While he was going, the crowds were nearly crushing him. A woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years who had spent all she had on doctors and yet could not be healed by any approached Jesus from behind and touched the end of his robe. Instantly, her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are hemming you in and pressing against you. In other words, who, who could tell? 
Someone did touch me, Jesus said. I know the power has gone out for me. When the woman saw that she was discovered, she came trembling and fell down before Jesus. In the presence of all the people, she declared the reason she had touched him and how she was instantly healed. Daughter, Jesus said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone came from the synagogue leader's house and said, your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. When Jesus heard it, he answered him, don't be afraid, only believe. And she will be saved. After he came to the house, he let no one enter with, he let no one enter with him except for Peter, John, James, and the child's father and mother. Everyone was crying and mourning for her. But Jesus said, stop crying. Because she is not dead, but only asleep. They laughed at him because they knew she was dead. So he took her by the hand and called out, Child, get up. Her spirit returned and she got up at once. Then Jesus gave orders that she be given something to eat. Her parents were astounded. But Jesus instructed them to tell no one what had happened. Let's pray together. Father, this is your word. It is living and it is active. Lord, it is unending. It is eternal. It is who you are. It is how we know you. Lord, help us to mine the depths of this scripture today. Help us to find all the truth that you have for us in it. But Lord, not just for head knowledge's sake, but Lord, help us to bridge that nine inch gap from the head to our heart. That this word might Cause us to change, to be more like you, to love you more. Father, help us not to miss what's important here and, and to focus on something that is lesser. Help us to see Jesus in this and who he is and his power and his glory. Help us to ignore our glory and our wants and desires and instead press into the one who is worthy of our faith and worthy of our adoration and worship. Lord, it is Jesus who is our rock and our Redeemer. It is Him that gives us clean hands. It is Him that we praise as holy forever and ever. Lord, give us an open heart, a sober spirit, and a ready and willing mind to receive this truth. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we see here that Jesus comes back to the other side of the shore, and big surprise, the crowds were expecting Him. We're talking about faith here. We said that a moment ago. Let me remind you, faith in Jesus is an active and observable way of living that is powered by Jesus's grace. The first thing we see when Jesus comes to the shore is a picture of active faith, a trust that is active and actionable. You see, Jesus comes back. The crowd that he returns to are Jews. It's the area of Capernaum that he had been doing all of his works up to this point. He was famous for what he was doing. The crowd had an idea that he would come back. And of course, as he arrives, they come before him and they begin to wait to see what he's going to do. But what's interesting here is a man named Jairus comes to him. Now, Jairus is a leader of a synagogue. He's not a priest, but he would have been in charge with making sure that each week in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, that it was ready for the Jews to come and to worship. He would have scheduled the preacher, the teacher. He would have made sure that the readings for the week were planned. This would have been a big deal because back then it wasn't a book or an iPhone to read from. It was a giant scroll. They had to be maintained. They had to make sure they had them out and ready. Jairus was a big deal. Jairus was a big deal. It was even a bigger deal that him, a Jew, would come before Jesus and fall down at his feet and beg him for help. I want to point out, however the differences and the similarities between last week's account and this week's, because I think it's striking. When Jesus returns, yet again, another man falls at his feet. Do you remember last week when Jesus got to the Gentile side of the Lake of Galilee and there was a demon-possessed man, a Gentile, not a believer in God, he also came and fell at Jesus' feet. But here on this side, Jairus comes and he pleads for help, doesn't he? He falls down in willing worship. He falls at Jesus' feet, knows that Jesus can do what he's been doing, and pleads with him for help. Do you remember the demoniac from last week? 
He fell down, but he pleaded for mercy from punishment which was rightfully deserved. That person fell down and compelled worship. Remember, we talked about the idea that Jesus compels worship. Whether you believe in him or not, there will come a day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And it's not going to be because you might agree or disagree. It's because he will demand it of you. This man on the Jewish side, he was concerned not for himself, but for his daughter. His only daughter was dying. Wouldn't you be concerned? Of course you would. The demoniac, however, was concerned simply for self-preservation. Now, remember, it wasn't actually the physical man. It was the demons inside of the man. I think you understand that. I think it's important to contrast these two reactions because they're similar, but with different perspectives, aren't they? And I think there's a lesson in it for us as Christians today living in a lost world that's no different than then. See, there's really only two kinds of people that we will encounter in our world today. And we ourselves will fall in one of these two categories. There are people that are seeking the kingdom of God. And then there are people that are under the influence of the world, meaning they are not in Christ. They are under the power of the prince of the principalities, the power of the air. They're, as Jesus called some of the Pharisees, they are children of Satan. They are under condemnation because of their sin. What's the difference? Well, we can kind of see a picture in these two men that have fallen down before Jesus. Notice that those who are seeking the kingdom of God above all things, they plead for intercession to the Lord. They ask Christ to help them in their greatest time and in their greatest need, like Jairus did. But true seekers of the kingdom of God yield to what God's will is, regardless of the outcome. Notice that those in the kingdom of God run to Jesus with their problems. He's their first stop along the way. They run to him and they share their cares and their burdens because they remember what Jesus said, that his yoke is easy and his burden is light, or his yoke is light and his burden is easy. You get the point. I mix them up all the time. Those seeking the kingdom of God trust that Jesus has all authority, all authority and can do all things. And listen, this is important. Those who are seeking the kingdom of God first above all things, they trust that the outcome is the best thing for them according to God's will. Their concern is for the glory of God, not for what they receive from their request from God. That's an important distinction of biblical Christianity. But then there are people like the demoniac who are under the influence of the world system, which is not Christ-centered. We know this from the word. These folks avoid Jesus at all costs, when in need of any help or assistance. Notice the Gentiles and the demons. Do you remember last week, after Jesus had delivered the man of the legion of demons and sent the pigs into the ocean, or not the ocean, the Sea of Galilee, excuse me, what was the Gentiles' reaction to Christ? Please leave, right? They could not believe the power that they witnessed. What was the demons' reaction to Christ? Of course, they they couldn't leave. They were under his authority, but they begged him, send us away, Lord. We don't want to be near you because we know what you're going to do to us. Those under the influence of the world view themselves as their ultimate authority. Have you met people like this? Only I can fix my problems. Only I can make sure that things go right. If you want it done right, you better do it yourself. Well, there's some practical truth in these statements for sure. Spiritually speaking, that is idolatry of the self. It's the idea that your goodness, your power, and your abilities and wisdom can somehow bribe God enough to forgive you for the sins that you've committed. It doesn't work. Those under the influence of the world, when they do approach God, typically it's to try out Jesus. Have you ever seen this? Well, let me try Jesus. Nothing else is working. Let me try him out. And they petition for help. They petition for guidance. The problem is they don't get the answer that they want. Lord, I really want the new Escalade. No, I'm just kidding. Right? I really want this. I really want that. Lord, help me with this job. But somehow it seems like that doesn't always happen. And then what do they do? What is their response to the outcome of their petition? They immediately reject God. They reject Jesus and they say, what is faith worth? Why should I have faith? Because what I asked I didn't get. The reality is they're rejecting Jesus because they didn't get what they desire. Not that Christ didn't answer the prayer. 
So it's important to look at this, and it's important to understand that these are the two categories that we're dealing with when we compare last week and this week's account. But when we come back to Jairus, the synagogue leader, he had heard the news about Jesus. Why did he fall down at Jesus' feet? Well, it said over and over before now in the gospel that all the works that Jesus did, all the miracles, the healings, uh, the forgiveness, the teachings, he was famous. People couldn't stop talking about him. There's a reason there was a crowd on the Sea of Galilee when he returned. But see, here's the thing about Jairus. He heard these things and he believed that Jesus could do what he asked him to do. It's really cool because when we think of Romans 10, 17, the famous verse that says, so faith comes from hearing and what is heard comes through the message about Christ. This is true for Jairus. Jairus heard the message about Christ in time on earth in his life. And because of that, he trusted, he had faith, he had pistis, that's the Greek word. He had trust that Jesus could do the thing that he was going to ask of him. And because Jairus believed, he pleaded Jesus. He pleaded with him. But see, in Jairus' mind, the question that he was asking Jesus was not, will you come, Jesus? Or that was the question, excuse me. The question was, will you come? The question was not, can you do it? And I confused you, let me help. Jairus knew that Jesus could do it. The question was, are you willing to come and do it for me? And that's how we have to approach Christ. We should believe that Christ is able to do all things. He says so himself. He says, with God, all things are possible. It's not about whether or not God can do the thing you ask him to do. It's whether or not it's his will and what's best for you. We need to trust that God's will is what's right. Notice the difference between this man and another man in the Gospel of Mark who also asked Jesus for healing for a child, but isn't quite sure whether Christ could do it or not. In Mark 9, 22 to 24, this man says to Jesus when he asks him to heal his son, but if you can do anything, Jesus, have compassion on us and help us. And then Jesus said to him, exactly, if you can, Jesus says, if you can, he says, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the father of the boy cried out, I do believe, help my unbelief. That's my battle cry, by the way, just so you all know. So Jairus, in his own way, is a little bit more advanced than this man. Jairus knows that Jesus can do it. The question is, is it his will to do it? This man gives us another better example. We're not preaching a sermon on that passage, but I need to say this because it's important. He says, if you can, Christ points out, what do you mean if I can? And then the man rightly says, okay, well, I can't believe unless you make me believe, so make me believe. So maybe that should be our prayer today, folks. Maybe the prayer should be, Christ, give me the belief that I need. And we're going to see later that that's how it works, actually, anyway. So that was an act of faith. We see Jairus come before Christ and actively say, I believe in you. I believe the things you can do. Will you come and do this thing? But then there's like an interruption in the story, almost. It's kind of disjunct, right? It doesn't make sense. But we're going to see here in the next, couple, next verses that there's an observable faith. It says here, while he was going, so he obviously said yes to Jairus, I will come to your house. While Jesus was going, the crowds were nearly crushing him. Notice the different reception for a second. The Gentiles, as we said before, were afraid of Jesus' power. He shows up, lone demoniac, right? All that stuff happens. They finally come out to see what occurs. When they see who Jesus is, they, they ask him to leave in fear. Here, the Jews are excited about what Jesus' power could do for them. Do you see that? They were all excited. There was a mob. How do I know? It says they were nearly crushing him. The streets in these towns would have been very narrow. There's no Humvees driving down them, right? They don't need to make them wide. People are walking. Might have had a donkey or something. So Jesus is being crushed, right? Like, this is a serious thing. Has anybody ever seen the, the running of the bulls in Pamplonia on TV? In Spain, you go, go home and watch YouTube and you'll see people packed in the streets of Spain, right? That's sort of kind of what this probably looked like, except there were no bulls. That's a good thing, right? Just Jesus. That's a better thing. And so it, it's all packed in. The Jews are excited. They're mobbing them. Lord, give us the stuff that we've heard about. And you might be thinking, well, yeah, one's wrong and one's right. What if I told you they were both wrong? 
both the Jews in this moment had the wrong heart motive and the Gentiles that were afraid of Christ also had the wrong heart motive. You see, both of them were focusing on how Jesus could affect them in their personal preference, comfort, wants, and desires. The Gentiles were so concerned that the power of Jesus was going to ruin their economy and maybe do something that they wouldn't like, that they said, please leave. They didn't even want to get to know who Jesus was. The Jews seemed like they loved Jesus, but really, and we'll see this flesh out as the gospel continues through our weeks and months ahead, they just wanted some of what Jesus offered, right? They wanted some of that good miracle stuff, some of that miracle whip. Jesus, give me some food for 10,000 people. Jesus, heal that paralytic over there. Jesus, give this to me. Give that to me. They both are wrong. Don't you see that it's the person and the identity of Jesus that is important? That's what we're supposed to desire. It's not what Jesus can do for us that makes us love Jesus. It's who Jesus is. He's the living God of the universe. He's the one that said, let, he's the one that said, let there be light. And there was. It is Jesus who has spoken about when Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It is Jesus who is that God. How do I know? John 1-1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And it says there was nothing created that wasn't created through the Word. How do we know the Word was Jesus? Because then John says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is what we should desire. And the Jews need to learn that in this moment. But as Jesus was going, a woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years who had spent all that she had on doctors and yet could not be healed by any. Notice that this woman was suffering as long as the woman that Jesus was going to see had been alive. This daughter was 12 years old. This woman was suffering with bleeding for 12 years. I don't really know what it is. Probably a woman thing. Other translations say hemorrhaging. Even though we don't know exactly what's going on, here's what we do know spiritually. She was a Jew in a Jewish community. This condition of hers for 12 years made her ritually unclean. That means she could not have had a social life. No one would have been allowed to socialize with her. She had no religious life because she was religiously and ritually unclean. She was not allowed to go to the temple. She was not allowed to go to the synagogue. She could not do any religious practices. And third, she had no family life because we'll learn in a second That even your family, if you were ritually unclean, could not be around you. It's as if she was socially and culturally dead. She was breathing. Her heart was pumping. She had to eat. She had to live. But she couldn't interact with anyone. It was like COVID on lockdown and you lived alone in an apartment and didn't leave. You might as well be dead because you're not really living. You follow me? Beside the the bleeding issue, right? Her physical issue that she was really suffering Her life was hard. It was hard. I want to read to you a section from everybody's favorite book in the Bible, the book of Leviticus. It's it's awesome. You should read it tonight. Chapter 15, 25 to 28 describes why this woman was in such a bad way. I want to read this to you because people overlook her condition. They look and they rightfully say, look at her faith. You know, she did all these things. But you don't understand how bad she was really Um, her situation was. It was really bad. Here's what it says. When a woman has a discharge of her blood for many days, though it is not not the time of her menstruation, or if she has a discharge beyond her period, she will be unclean all the days of her unclean discharge as she is during the days of her menstruation. Any bed she lies on during the days of her discharge will be like her bed during menstrual impurity. Any furniture she sits on will be unclean as in her menstrual period. Everyone who touches them will be unclean. He must wash his clothes and bathe with water and he will remain unclean until evening. When she is cured of her discharge, she is to count seven days and after that she will be clean. Now that's a lot. That is not applicable for Christians today. So good news, right? Woo! All right. But it's important because that was in effect when this woman was alive. Her life was hard. Notice she tried everything to restore her life, it says. She spent all her money on doctors. I wonder how effective they were back then. And it says nothing worked. Actually, when we look at the Gospel of Mark, he adds this. The processes that the doctors used on her actually made it worse. It says she had endured much under many doctors. She had spent everything she had and she was not helped at all. On the contrary, she became worse. This woman was desperate. 
Nothing worked. She couldn't go to the church. They wouldn't let her in. There was no doctor that could help her. She had no money left. And she continued to get bad. Yet, here is Jesus walking through the streets. And in her mind, it had to have been the only hope that she had left. So what did she do? She approached Jesus from behind and touched the end of his robe. And instantly, her bleeding stopped. Notice how she humbly comes before Jesus. She probably had to fight through the mob herself. Now, ladies, if you've had any conditions sort of what we just described, how much energy do you have to fight through a mob of people? She didn't fall down before him like the man did. She simply just needed to touch the littlest bit of his clothing. It's not clear how much faith she had. It's easy to ascribe all this faith to her, right? Oh, she had all this faith. If only she touched, maybe, I don't know. It doesn't say. But regardless of how much faith she had, it was enough, wasn't it? It was enough. See, here's an important thing in the Christian faith, and I think we need to hear this as an encouragement. It's not the faith we have that saves us. It's the object of our faith. I can have faith, as we said early on in the introduction to the sermon, I can have faith in a multitude of things. None of it's going to save me. That faith is empty. It does nothing. But if I have faith or trust, if I'm fully convinced in the perfect person and finished work of Jesus Christ, that will save me. Not because of the faith, but because of what Christ has done on the cross. Know that. You will hear false teaching. The more faith you have, you can claim these things. You just have to have more faith. Faith is not what saves you. It is Jesus Christ. Faith is something he gives you. It is trust. Faith is not a magic debit card that is refilled so you can get spiritual things. Faith is your convinced trust that Christ is worthy and you are not. Faith is trust that Christ paid your fine that you couldn't. Trust is believing that Jesus is fully God and fully man, that he lived a perfect life that you couldn't, and that he took your place to be punished for sins that you rightly committed. That's what faith is. And if my eyes could only find where I left the paper. There we go. So what's important? It's not the faith that she had. It's the result of the faith, right? Jesus sovereignly healed her, didn't he? And it wasn't just about the blood. It wasn't just about I'm physically unwell and Jesus gives her the gift of healing physically. He did do that. He did restore her physically so that her life could be more normal without suffering. But he also healed her social problem, didn't he? Now she's able to have a relationship with other people in her community. And he healed her religious issue. Now she is able to be ritually clean and to worship the God who healed her. Did you catch what I said there? She can worship the God who healed her. Notice that most people look at this and they say, well, Jesus let an unclean person touch him. Now he's unclean. Because isn't that what Leviticus said? If anybody touches her, Jesus is the God of the universe. He doesn't get unclean by dirty people. He makes dirty people clean because of his perfection. That's our God. His purity cleans the impure. And then the best part, Jesus speaks for the first time. He says, who touched me? And then when everybody denied it, good old Peter, good old foot in the mouth Peter, that's my kind of guy. He says, master, the crowds are hemming you in and pressing against you. No, he doesn't say this, but clearly he's saying, how could anybody know? It's not a question of ignorance on the, on the part of Jesus. Jesus is omnipotent, he's omniscient, and omnipresent. Like He knows everything there is to know. It is a question to compel a confession from the woman. Even Peter, we see here, misunderstands the power of Jesus. Like, why would Peter even think that Jesus doesn't know? It's besides the point. We love Peter, he's our favorite foot-and-mouth guy, right? I love him. The question that Jesus asked is a gracious prompt to draw the woman to a public confession of faith. Do you see that? He knows exactly who touched him. He said to Peter, someone did touch me. I know the power has gone out for me. When the woman saw that she was discovered, she came trembling and fell down before him. There we go again. Everybody falls down before Jesus. First the demoniac, then the man, and now the woman. 
And I think you too, one day when you meet him, you will fall down before him too. And that's a good thing, ladies and gentlemen. She knows or she shows discernment of the power and person of Jesus. She knows that he knows who's on first. No, I'm kidding. She knows that he knows that she's the one that touched him. Jesus 100% knew that it was her. I want to show you something here. Jesus is not a power vending machine. I want you to hear that this morning. He's not a vending machine dependent on a willing participant to walk up to him and press the desired menu button like on a Coke machine. That's not who Jesus is. Jesus reaches down to us and personally and intimately calls each one of his elect to a uniquely personal relationship. Jesus, whether she knew it or not, gave her the faith to reach out and touch his hem. Jesus sovereignly orchestrated all the events that were going on in this woman's life to hear about this, to hear about that, to be here, to be there, so that she was in the right place at the right time. And when Jesus walked down, he knew that she was going to press through the crowd and touch his robe and be healed. That's how powerful our Jesus is. He is not a random genie that is waiting on your wisdom and hopefully effort to ask him for something. Our God has authority over all things, and that means your lost or saved life. Just know that. That's a good news message right there. Jesus is, in fact, calling this woman to a public confession to tell all that he did for her in that moment. Remember the demoniac when he asks to follow Jesus after he's delivered from the demons? He's like, Jesus, please let me follow you. You're the deal, man. You're the bee's knees. Jesus says, no, instead, I want you to go to these people that were too afraid to talk to me. And I want you to tell them all that I've done for you. In this case, Jesus is compelling her publicly in the middle of the crowd to confess what he has done for her in the moment. That he has given her true healing. That he has given her a new and restored life spiritually, socially, and physically. So in the presence of all the people, she did declare the reason she had touched him and how she was instantly healed. How awesome is that? And in response, Jesus, Jesus publicly declares why and how this woman was saved. He says, daughter, first of all, ladies, if that doesn't give you pause, look at it again. Woman never met Jesus before, touches his hem, she's unclean, outcast from the religious community. And he turns and he says, daughter, if you are in Christ, you are his daughter. Men, if you are in Christ, you are his son. Jesus declares her family. This is us when we trust in Christ. Don't seek lesser things. Don't seek blessings from the genie of blessings. Seek a familial, intimate, personal, and eternal relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And if that doesn't excite you, examine your hearts. You're not in Christ. Jesus is the point. I can't say that enough. And then what does he say? He says, daughter, he said to her, your faith has saved you. Now, you might say, well, wait a second, Pastor Chuck. You just said it's not the faith that saves you. It's the object of your faith. Correct. The object of her faith was saying it. Right? If, if Samuel walked up to her and said, hey, lady, your faith just saved you. She would be right to correct him and say, no, Jesus saved me. But if Jesus says it, it means this. Your trust in me, daughter, was enough to save you. Know that today. Look, she trusted in doctors. That was a form of faith, wasn't it? She trusted in doctors. It didn't work. It was not effective. She trusted in her money to pay people to help her. Did it help? No, nope. not good faith. She could have trusted anything else. Essential oils, right? Didn't help her. See, it was not the faith that saved her. It was who she had faith in. But she did in the end trust Jesus alone, didn't she? She trusted Jesus alone. Was that effective? Absolutely. Why? Because Jesus is God. I need you to hear this. Jesus is God. He is the second person of the Trinity. 
If you want a relationship with God, if you want to be forgiven for the sins that you have committed, there is only one way to do that, and that is putting your full trust into Jesus Christ the Lord. You see, Jesus didn't come to give us nice stories or a Christmas morning full of presents. Jesus is God who descended into flesh to live a perfect life that we couldn't to fulfill all of the scriptures. It's all about him. He came to do all that was right. And he died in a point of death that he didn't deserve in our place. He died a real death and he rose from the grave on the third day. And after teaching many things and appearing to people over a 40 day period, he ascended into heaven where he is seated at the right hand of the father. Why is that important? You say, because when you repent of your sins, when you turn from your way of living and you turn to Christ and you say, Lord, I am a sinner. I have violated your holy law. You want perfection for me. But the minute I could think consciously, I sinned against you. And that was enough to separate us for an eternity. But I recognize that you did what I could and that you took my place. I trust in what you did and who you are and not in myself. In that moment, that is faith. That is trust. It says you are born again. That you are a new creation. That the Holy Spirit now lives in your heart. You no longer live for yourself or sin or evil. You now are seeking the things of the kingdom of God first and all other things will be added to you. That's the good news of the gospel. Not if you have enough faith, you'll get more money. If that's what you're in Christianity for, you are of the devil. Run. That is false teaching. Today we talked in 2 John about false teachers that were coming to a church. If anyone tells you that faith is about anything else but worshiping, glorifying, serving, and obeying the Lord of Lords and the King, and I can't say it loud enough, let me calm down, the King of Kings, Jesus, it is a false gospel. The good news is not about you. It's about the glory of God and Him alone. And then Jesus says, go in peace. <laughs> go in peace. And even here we have a misunderstanding. What does he mean? Peace with what? Christmas time. The Prince of Peace. Peace on earth. It is not your nice, comfortable, quiet at home, crocheting or reading a good book. It's not even peace between people. We know that the Bible teaches that there will never be peace from wars and violence until Christ comes back again. It literally means peace with God himself. The Bible teaches that if you are not trusting in Christ, if you have not been saved, you're not just under punishment. You're not just a bad person in God's eyes. You are at war with God. Last week, we sang a song, God of Angel Armies. Do you want to fight that God and that army? You're not going to win. It was peace with God himself. And that is the real miracle, ladies and gentlemen. It's not the healing of the blood. That is the true healing. It is the healing and mending of a broken relationship from a sinful human that deserves nothing but death and a holy and perfect God that alone is worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. See, many people, believers and unbelievers alike, harbor resentment towards God and even Jesus Christ. They pray and they seek for healing for loved ones, and it never comes. They witness wars and tragedies and natural disasters without any positive resolution. The truth is that trusting in Christ for your salvation is not about you and what he can do for your problems. It is about you, his creation, being made right before a holy God so that you can love him, worship him, and glorify him. It's about Jesus. Real faith and real trust in the perfect person and finished work of Christ means understanding his sovereign power and rule and trusting that all that happens or does not happen is what he has willed to occur. The point of our faith in Jesus is so that we can be forgiven for our high crimes of treason against the creator God of the universe and then live under his rule as our sovereign Lord forever. So we've seen active faith. We've seen observable faith. Now we're going to see that faith is a gift. Because in this moment, while Jesus is speaking, someone came from the synagogue leader's house. Remember him? His name is Jairus. Right? 
And he said, your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. And when Jesus heard it, he just said, don't be afraid. Only believe. And she will be saved. For these people, the evidence suggests that all is lost. Healing is not possible, Jesus. She's dead. That's an undoable condition. Dead is dead. For us, that's true. They have a partial understanding of Jesus' identity and power. But here's what you know, Christian, in the room. No matter how bleak your circumstances are, Jesus is able to intercede and give you what you need. Do you believe that today? I do. Notice it's what you need. Jesus' response shows the heart of the matter. He says, don't be afraid, only believe. In other words, fear means you doubt, and faith means you trust, right? Don't be afraid, only believe. And here's what's great. I don't focus on this a lot, but when you look at the Greek words for uh, don't, don't be afraid, only believe, it's called aorist tense, and what it means is it really says keep on believing. It's an active belief, right? It's not believe once. Not believe twice. It's keep on believing. That's like us as Christians. We keep on repenting and we keep on believing in the gospel. And that begs the question, what good is faith if what we ask for doesn't always happen? We touched on this a moment ago. Well, first of all, we should have faith in Christ, not what we want to happen. And that's the problem, right? We have faith in the thing we want, not in the one that we're asking to do it for us. The second thing is that in this instance... God is going to give what is being asked because it's his will for the girl to be raised. And we're going to see the reason he's doing it is not just because he's giving them something. He's giving them the gift to trust him. Because, listen, man, if somebody raises somebody from the dead in front of you, you might want to trust them. Right? Like, that's important. And third, we are to keep on believing in Jesus, not what miracles he performs. His miracles are irrelevant. He's the real deal. Jesus uses miracles to authenticate his identity as Messiah, Son of God, and God with us. So after he came to the house, he let no one enter with him except for Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. And of course, there's a big scene. Everybody's crying and mourning. And he commands them, stop crying because she is not dead, but asleep. And what is their response? They laughed at Jesus. And you know what that laughing is, right? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, right, dude, she's dead as a doorknob, don't smell her. See, in this time, they would hire professional mourners. Jairus was a well-to-do man. He was a leader of a synagogue. He would have afforded this. This was customary. You were more holy the more you mourned, and the more you put ashes on your head and wore sackcloth. We heard earlier that they had flute players playing it, right, in an earlier account in the gospel. They had already decided this was game over. She is dead. And Jesus says, shut up. He takes the family, the family and his inner circle into the room. This is the first time in the Gospel of Luke we see his inner circle. James, Peter, and John. Jesus tells the true reality. He says, listen, people, she's just asleep. She's not dead. Now, don't misunderstand this. The child was physically dead. Jesus is using a figure of speech saying that his power is so great that raising a dead person for God is just like waking up a kid sleeping in the next room. How do we know she was dead? It says her spirit returned. Your spirit can't be gone if you're not dead. And it says she was raised back to life. And notice the response from the statement, mocking laughter. Ladies and gentlemen, when we limit the power of Jesus in our minds and our hearts, when our perception, our humanness, Shades how we look at Jesus, we do no different than them. We may not laugh, laugh and mock knowingly, but we are. Let me give you some examples missionally. Listen, we had these community cookouts that we're doing in Tawanda. We did one at Brother Jim's house and we're doing two at Brother Jeff's house. And me and other people were like, man, nobody's going to come. We're going to walk. We go door to door and we hand out an invitation. It literally says, come have a free cookout with us. We just want to get to know you. And guess what? People have showed up every time. We had four the first time, and it was a rainy day. We showed up anyway. I can't believe we had anybody. And the second time, I was the one mocking. It's 6 o'clock, and I'm there like, oh, woe is me. It failed. Nobody's here. And then 6.15, an army of people start walking up the streets. We had like 20 folks at that cookout. How about relationally? Rachel's husband, I met him about a year ago. There he is. Sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to embarrass you, Hoyt. Right? Um, he shows up to a he shows up to a bonfire out here 
and it was supposed to be a fellowship of church people. And Rachel brings him and her parents and he starts debating with me about Christianity. And he left and I thought, yeah, he'll never believe. He just got baptized a few weeks ago. That dude's sitting back there being an usher right now. That dude back there keeps saying, is this a good Bible? Is that a good Bible? This dude calls me weekly about theological questions. This dude, in some cases, I think has more faith than I do. I mocked him. I mocked God. (laughs) You can't make Derek Sullivan alive. There he is. Holy Spirit in him. How about spiritually? Before you were saved, didn't you mock the gospel? Didn't you hear the gospel and think, I don't need that nonsense? The truth is that our faith in Jesus is not a product of our wise and intelligent minds. Left to our own devices, we would also mock Jesus. And truthfully, we probably mock him from time to time even now, like we just talked about. But even this faith or trust we place in Jesus must be given to us. In other words, no one believes in Jesus apart from him giving us the supernatural power to believe. The Bible says that given a choice, we would all run from God. We would embrace our sin. Ezekiel talks about a time when our hearts of stone need to be supernaturally turned into hearts of flesh by God so we can even see with spiritual eyes. Without the miracle of Christ waking us up from our spiritual death, we would not believe either. We would mock and call the message of Christ stupid and ridiculous. I think this speaks for itself. This is 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But it is the power of God to us who are being saved. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will set aside the intelligence of the intelligent. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the debater of this age? Hasn't God made the the world's wisdom foolish? For since in God's wisdom, the world did not know God through wisdom. God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of what is preached. For the Jews ask for signs and the Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block for the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Yet to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, that means everybody, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. And God's weakness is stronger than human strength. It's about Christ, folks. And like in this account, Jesus not only saves us 100% by his power, work and will, but he also gives us 100% of the faith we need to believe in him. Jesus ignored their laughter and mocking. He didn't rebuke them. Do you notice that? He just goes into the room and he freely gives what they need and not what they want. He gives them the reason to trust in him. He brings the dead girl back to life. That's the gift of faith. So he took her up and he said, child, get up. Her spirit returned. She got up at once. And then he tells them to give her something to eat. And of course, everybody's astounded. Like they can't even believe it. And neither would you. Jesus proved the belief was placed in the right thing. And it was himself. They believed in what Christ could do. And he raised the child, proving that his authority over life and death is real. And he even gave proof of life. Why is it important that he said eat something? Only alive people can eat. That's why Jesus ate fish after he was resurrected on the shore with the disciples. It wasn't because he needed to. It's because he was showing them, I'm flesh and blood. I'm not some ghost. I am the living word of God that has risen from the dead. In this account, Jesus gave all those who asked of him the faith they needed to be saved, fellowship with him they didn't know that they wanted, And a free lesson that he is God with authority over everything, even life itself. Is there any area in your life that you lack belief that Jesus can heal, deliver, solve or restore for you? Is there any place in your life that you're struggling? Do you constantly stress about hard issues, impossible scenarios or what seems to you like a foregone conclusion? If so, you're a human with a fallen suit of flesh. Welcome to the club. We're all in it. The encouragement we can take from today's passage is this. Ready? If Jesus can raise a dead girl back to life and heal a 12 years long chronic ailment, then he can certainly be trusted to lead you and keep you in your life. Can he? Do you lack trust, belief and certainty about who Jesus is and what he said he can do? 
The solution is to do in your heart what Jairus, the synagogue leader, did in public. Fall down before the Lord Jesus. Plead for more trust and more belief. Confess your sins and beg his forgiveness. Know that he promises to give you all of that and so much more. Let us pray.